Hey guys, sorry for the delay. Finally, I got it working. So, uh, my name is Kaizu. Uh, this is a new pilot uh, class in the sense that everything is experimental. Um, I will try to teach a new college ready grammar class over the next couple of years, and the plan is three years. And we will take about 30 weeks every year and do it overall three years in about um, 90 weeks. I don't have a fixed schedule because everything is experimental and I don't want to commit to a, a fixed schedule so that I have certain flexibilities. But starting this week, uh, the current plan for this year is that uh, unless I announce something different, we will, every week, we will meet on Sunday um, here on the West Coast. It's uh, Pacific time, 10 o'clock, and Eastern time, of course, it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So unless we hit some uh, holidays like Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas, I will surely notice in advance when we will not meet. Um, so every lecture will be uh, deliver the live here at YouTube live streaming and here's my channel you should subscribe to the channel um, so that you can get uh, timely notice regarding our uh, lectures so why am I doing this well before I discuss that Perhaps I should introduce myself a little bit. Um, again, my name is Kai, Kai Zhu. Like many of your parents, I came from China. Uh, I came to the United States in 1995 as a graduate student. And I went to graduate school to study computer networking. We'll actually talk about that a little bit today. So I spent five years in graduate school, first got a PhD, and then came to Silicon Valley here to work as a um, computer software engineer. I worked for about five years, then I went to law school. That's when, that was about in uh, 2005, uh, yeah, so quite a long time ago. That's when I became very serious about English writing because uh, everybody know, should know that um, our lawyering is mostly about writing. Over the years, I developed very strong interest in uh, English writing and uh, studying grammar, usage, all that. And I found that uh, um, just being an engineer and uh, being a lawyer actually share quite similarities in terms of English writing, and that's because both of our per, uh, both professions need to have a writing style that is primarily for the purpose of passing information from the writer to the reader, and it is very important in both professions to sustain a certain writing style and the shared purpose of our writings, either as an engineer or as a lawyer is to make sure that the information you pass from the right to the reader is accurate and efficient. Of course, your information has to be accurate, otherwise it defeats the purpose of your writing. And then it has to be efficient in the sense that you want the reader to understand what you try to say very quickly and of course precisely in the ideal situation and it turns out that that's a remarkably difficult job uh, for two reasons one somehow um, english has a lot of rules and especially usage issues so it's quite difficult to understand all rules and to write effectively and two, in today's world, somehow, our public schools have decided not to seriously teach 
very fundamental sense of writing, like grammar. That has been going on for almost half a century now. So there was a um, reform in late, late 60s and early 70s. Gradually, just like math, the schools have somehow just downplayed the importance of grammar and then not to just give all the students a very solid education on grammar. And it turns out after several generations, many of your English teachers, let me repeat, your English teachers, they do not have a very good just understanding of grammar. And that's really a tragedy. So as the result, the whole society today somehow, you know, most people's education in terms of um, writing in the conventional way has been, you know, far more inferior than a couple of generations ago. So that's something both as a surprise to me as a non-native speaker and as a citizen, just I feel that this is something really bad for the country in the long run. Because if our schools are not doing the right thing, then America will gradually lose its competitive advantage. I once talked to a um, um, pretty senior lawyer. He just moaned that in today's America, young people do not know math, do not know how to write. It just kind of just very worrisome for those older generations. So I decided to do something, hopefully making a little bit impact on the system. And uh, I found that um, on the market, there are no actually no good grammar books for um, middle school or high school students. The books that you can find to help you to say pass the SAT exam or just for other similar exams or um, meet some other requirement before you go to college, those books tend to be kind of very commercial in nature. Um, they are not very rigorous and sometimes they contain a lot of mistakes. And good grammar books do exist, but most of them, if not all of them, are for college students. So that means that those books tend to be quite academic, a lot of just uh, unfamiliar and intimidating just academic terms, and sometimes unnecessarily complex. So I really hope that I want to just make some contribution and to make a change to the status quo. So I have my own kids going to high school. Uh, my elder son is an eighth grader. He will be in high school next year. And I'm very concerned about uh, the education that he can receive at school. So I want to do something for him and for my younger son, who is a sixth uh, grader, and then for um, other students in the country. So I decided to teach uh, um, this ecology-ready grammar class. Uh, it's a pilot program. Um, we'll see how it goes. So um, over the next three years, we will meet three, uh, 30 weeks a year. And in 90 weeks, I believe we should have a very solid run on learning grammar. And there will be some uh, homework or exercises after each lecture. Um, so that's the background. Let's just get started. So as an engineer, I really want to, for each of my lectures, especially English related, I want to start with a big picture uh, of what we are going into, why we are doing this. Okay, this may come as a surprise to many of you, 
What is this? Grammar is the communication protocol for writing. What does that mean? Well, for those of you who don't know what a protocol is, at least you use them every day. Because whenever you go to the internet, you use your Google to search anything you wanted. And of course, you use a cell phone to browse uh, news um, or other information. You are using the internet. The internet is a gigantic network that is built on many, many layers of so-called communication protocols. Why am I talking about this? First, because I have a PhD in computer networking, and I actually wrote one of the most important routing protocols. Actually, that's the foundation of English called BGP for five years before I went to law school. So I know this scene reasonably well, let's just say that. And then I found that this analogy is not just accurate, but also very profound. So let's take a look at uh, what a computer, no uh, computer network looks like. So today's internet is built on a pr um, just kind of idealized pro um, communication protocol stack called TCP IP. And TCP IP is a huge family of protocols, but what is a protocol? Protocol essentially is a set of rules between two or sometimes multiple uh, participants to a communication. Let's take a look at this uh, computer network right here. So all the computers connect to each other uh, via a huge internet network, right? But at any given time, unless you have some protocol like a multicast, usually it's a point-to-point -point communication. Um, sometimes going through a third party, but conceptually, most of the communication happens like in this picture. Two computers talk to each other uh, and exchange information. And for that to happen, whatever data you send, between the two uh, entities go through a whole stack of so-called protocols. But at each layer, so we call stack, at each layer, two endpoints of a certain protocol they, uh, from the two computers, from the sender to receiver, of course, the roles can be reversed. Sender can become receiver, receiver can become sender, they exchange certain information. And it's the information is encapsulated what we call packets. And different layers, they could have different terms. But essentially, it's just a packet uh, where you have binary data. And usually a packet has a header and a payload. All protocols just behave like that. But important thing is that the protocol needs to be predefined and agreed upon by the two parties and well understood. So when computer A talk to B, A send the data in certain specific ways. And computer B must understand those pre-agreed patterns and the rules in order to interpret that data packet properly. Otherwise, the information is just garbage. There's no way if the two endpoints did not agree upon what the pattern, what the rules are regarding such data. Just think about it. If you, if you receive a stream of 0101 such a binary data, and you don't know what rows, bits, or bytes represent, then you certainly have no idea what you are getting.
and how to interpret that whole stream. So it's extremely important that a protocol is well understood by both parties. And not just that, when we do um, design the computer network or a protocol, there are certain goals in mind. First, your communication has to be correct. Whatever data you send to the other end, it must be exactly what you want to send. So for that to happen, you first want to make sure that the data arriving at the other end has no other security issues, there's no corruption or that. And for that to happen, there are just huge uh, set of just a kind of technologies behind the scene, but you don't have to worry about it. The point is that your communication has to be correct first. Okay, but being correct is not the only goal. You also want your communication to be quite productive, meaning that you don't want to send um, just unnecessary information, and you want your data trans um, um, travel the network in a very efficient way, so that it costs less bandwidth, less delay. And uh, the other side would kind of robust. If there anything goes wrong, the communication can recover from those unexpected events or that. So two major things. You want to correct this and you want efficiency. So those two things are very important to a communication session to happen. And now, why I'm talking about all of this, not just to show off my technical background, but because that's exactly how you want to write. Think about it. For most of the writing, um, the primary purpose is just communication, right? You write, you have a certain audience in mind. Of course, there are different kinds of Writings. Well, roughly, there are two kinds. That's the way how I classify it. One kind of writing is primarily for entertainment. Like you write a novel, you write a script, you write a drama, you write a poem, all that. The primary purpose of that kind of writing is not just to merely pass information. They have some other goals in mind. So that's a kind of just a, most of the creative writings about that. Um, of course, not everybody can become a Shakespeare or Dickens, but that kind of writing, um, it's quite different from what I call plain English writing. Well, plain English writing is mostly for information passing. You want to deliver information from your sender to your receiver, in that case, your reader. Whether you are a lawyer, or you are a scientist, or you are an engineer, or you are business executive, you write with the audience in mind. You want to convince your audience to believe what you write. So you want to be persuasive. But before that, you want to be credible. You want to make sure that the scene, the information you put into your writing is exactly what you want to, the audience to understand. Of course, you may want to deliberately mislead your audience. That can happen. But still, even in that case, you want to sound credible and persuasive. So how do you do that? Well, just analogous to the computer communications example, you need a protocol. And what is that protocol? It's grammar. Grammar tells how we write a sentence. And more importantly, once you have written it, a reader, how the reader should understand what you wrote. Okay? For example, there are certain rules about the sentence structures. 
what kind of words you can put in there. There are certain rules. If you don't follow them, your reader may expect something quite different. And in that case, there's a just a great chance that your reader may not understand or not understand exactly what you mean. And in many cases, he or she will misunderstand what you wrote. And that could lead to disaster. So grammar, it's just like the communication protocol between the sender and the receiver. In this case, it's between the writer and the reader for that communication to be both accurate and efficient. That's the big picture. Okay, so I'm talking from the perspective of an engineer and as a lawyer. Um, here uh, are some quotes uh, from one of the just um, uh, greatest uh, grammarians. Uh, his name uh, is Brian Garner. Uh, we'll talk about him a little bit uh, in this lecture, but uh, he's a lawyer. He actually is the just godfather of writing for the majority part of all practice in American lawyers, believe it or not. Um, his lectures usually an hour, it's over a thousand dollars when he tools, but he wrote a lot of books as well. We actually will watch a short video from him today. So here's what he said. Basically, in its usual sense, grammar is the set of rules governing how words are put together in sentences. Rules are very important. Words and sentences to communicate ideas or the study of these rules. Here's a very important line. Native speakers of a language learn them unconsciously. What that means is that um, I can actually testify to this. I, I grew up, of course, uh, and uh, I received my education in China. Most Chinese people don't know grammar per se for Chinese. They may not even know what grammar means for Chinese. Why? Because as native speakers, we just don't see something as a grammar as necessary. So there are certain rules, but I don't recall there's any formal education on grammar when we grow up. I believe that's still the case today. We don't have a formal education on, say, Chinese grammar per se. But as a foreigner, it's very different. You can check with your parents. When we study English as foreigners, grammar was speak and central to our study. We learn more grammar than more words, um, at least at the beginning in our study. And it was a huge turn off and a big headache. Those things were so difficult to us, and most people, after many, many years of study, they still struggle. But for native speakers, everything sounds just normal to you, right? You just, you were born with it. But that's actually a big issue because once you are in um, grade school, high school, college, you usually rely on your so-called sense, your feeling about how you should write. And many times your sense and feelings actually are incorrect or at least dubious, kind of just borderline incorrect. So, that's mostly about grammar. Grammar actually, believe it or not, is relatively easy as compared to another big topic, which is also very important for your writing. That is about usage. So, here you say that, uh, you see that another quote from uh, Brian Garner, the rules got most construction in any given language the small minorities of construction that lie outside those rules fall mostly into the category of 
idioms and customary usage. So what are usages? Well, here's a, uh, um, Brian Gunner and with Scalia. So we will see that he is the leading author of a use, huge usage book called uh, Modern um, just a usage guide, Gunner's uh, guide, actually. So usage are exceptions to grammars because English grammar is not like a computer language grammar, whether it's Java or Python or C++ or C, the those languages all have their grammars. But those grammars are strictly defined before you can use the language. And anything that conforms to the grammar will create an issue immediately, either by the computer compiler or the interpreter. Your code just cannot run if your code does not conform to the grammar. But English is a human language grammar, and there's no people or kind of language god who say what the rules should be. The grammar was kind of just formed over years and it's always evolving, meaning that grammar rules can change, although relatively at a slower pace as compared to usage. But because grammar is kind of in the flux, it's always evolving, there are always are things that are exceptions to the rules. So rules are called usages. And that's a much more challenging uh, thing for you to learn because as exceptions, it's hard to follow and track them. Every particular usage, you have to know it individually. So that's why usually when you have a grammar book, it's not that big. Usually, um, I'm not sure if you can see me, um, but let me try. Oops. Uh, yeah. I think I might be able to show. Yes. Okay. Here's camera. So this is a book. Um, this book is, uh, which we'll see later. It's 100 year old. The book is not that big. But if I show you my um, usage book, it will be much thicker. So actually, grammar is easier than usage. And there, there are also other things called idioms. Those are even more strange because they don't follow grammar at all. An idiom is just a, a conventional usage that nobody can explain why it's like that. It's just kind of just a hard-coded rules that everybody agreed upon and want to follow. In many cases, not if not most cases, idioms defeat grammar because that's why they're idioms. They don't follow grammar at all. So that's another area that caused great headaches for your writing. But grammar it's so important that it governs at least 80% of the rules that you want to follow in your writing. And it's actually quite simple as compared to usage and uh, uh, idioms because there are rules, right? Rules mean that there are certain logics behind those rules. And that's exactly why we can systematically study grammar. Well, you cannot systematically study usage. Okay, so all that. Now, let's talk about my, um, this is Brian Garner on the left-hand side. Mr. Garner is a lawyer from Texas. And to his right is the late Supreme Court Justice Antonius, uh, Antonin uh, Scalia. So you might or might not have heard of his name, 
but everybody should know Justice Scalia has been the best writer in the Supreme Court for the last 50 years. Here's a quick um, Google search. If you search Scalia writing, you'll see all kinds of entries about his writing. He's a great writer. Of course, um, all Supreme Court justices are great writers, but among them, they're still the best of best. Okay? So, of course, he graduated from Harvard Law School. Here are two books that Mr. Garner co-authored with Justice Scalia. I'm posting this just to tell you what kind of figure Mr. Garner is in legal writing and in writing in general. If you happen to have heard a book up um, with the title uh, The Chicago Manu, that's a, a style manu followed by many, many, many publishers. Mr. Garner actually wrote the grammar uh, just punctuation uh, section for the Chicago style, Scott Chicago Manual of Style. So he wrote before um, Justice Scalia passed, so Mr. Garner co-wrote those books with uh, um, Justice Scalia. So we're going to watch a short video to get a better idea. Uh, let me see. Oops. Okay, here is a very short video that I will... Hello and welcome to the Better Grammar for Lawyers. This is uh, the fourth uh, version of Better Grammar. It's a totally new format Hold that we're going to be going through. We Let me actually replay this video. Not sure. Where is this? Okay, there we go. Hello and welcome to the Better Grammar for Lawyers. This is uh, the fourth uh, version of Better Grammar. It's a totally new format that we're going to be going through. We might talk about a little bit about what exactly is good grammar. What exactly is it? It's, it's a matter of communicating clearly and effectively um, but it's not enough just to be understandable. You also want to be credible. It's important to achieve credibility as well, and that is to use the language the way educated speakers uh, write and speak. And so uh, I pulled off from our grammar room here at Law Pros, of course, we produce dictionaries and, and grammar books, and I pulled off the shelves a few of my own favorites we have in our grammar room no fewer than 800 books called English Grammar. One of them is by James Fernald, F-E-R-N-A-L-D. It is called the, A Working Grammar of the English Language. And it's a good, sturdy, reliable book. Another one is a very entertaining book by Theodore Bernstein called Do's, Don'ts, and Maybes of the English Language. Do's, Don'ts, and Maybes of English Usage. Okay. So, the reason I play that short clip for you is because um, I want to tell you about this book that uh, um, Mr. Garner recommended. So, let me get rid of this. Uh, okay, there we go. Here is the book that we just saw, the same book, and this book is 100 years old, okay? This is a book, and I watched that video clip um, a long time ago, and out of my curiosity, I tried to find that book. And it was hard to get it because it's 100 years um, old. So it took me some time to get a copy. And the reason I want to show you about this book is that 
um, you don't see this kind of book anymore. All right, it's 100 year old. Let's take a look at its uh, table of contents. Very simple. That's how a book from 100 years ago looked like. The table of contents here on the two pages, right? And then you see just two parts, part one and part two. Part one is the parts of speech. Right here, the parts of speech. We'll see what that means in a minute. The second part, part two, the sentence. Of course, um, in both part, in both parts you see different sections, but not that complicated. So you can see a noun, pronoun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, interjection. So there are A parts of speech. And for the sentence part, it's even more simpler. The sentence defined, the simple sentence, complex and compound sentences. That's about it. Okay. If you open any grammar book of the day, it will look very different. Okay. But the point is that the old fashioned conventional or orthodox American way um, of discussing grammars, it's just two parts. Parts of speech, meaning words, individual words, and then sentences. That's about it. Today's uh, grammar book, if you open any kind, they don't present grammar in such a way. Um, it's hard to judge which one is better, but I found that personally, I found that from writing's perspective, the old fashioned way has a huge advantage because you will jump right to the point to learn grammar from a very practical perspective. That is how to write your sentences. Okay. So that's what we are going to do in this class. We will start from day one, forget about all those just kind of confusing definitions, and we will jump right into how to write sentence correctly and effectively. And we'll start with simple cases. Okay. So why study grammar? Well, we already talked about that just a uh, have it already, but here are some, again, uh, some quotes from Mr. Garner. So I don't have to read this out loud to you, but you can quickly see that grammar will be hugely important for your future career because no matter which profession you choose, communicating with other people effectively is hugely important. And especially, I know here, everybody, you know, it's ABC, your parents have great expectation on you and want to send you to the best schools and have a great career in the future. But at some point, you'll find out that the communication with other people perhaps will be more important than your specific just kind of specialized skill set, whether you are just engineers, scientists, lawyers, doctors, executives, whatever, just kind of specialized knowledge you possess, but the common just a, um, denominator is that you need to communicate with other people effectively, okay? And a huge part of that comes from writing. Of course, you want to be a very good just a kind of verbal communicator as well. You want to be able to speak very, just a clearly articulate your idea just precisely. And that's a huge, just kind of a learning curve for that. But writing is equally, if not more so, hugely, hugely important. And to do that, you really want to master grammar. Okay. So, um, here are some of the 
paper version books, grammar and usage books I use to teach this class. And a few of the titles here are actually from uh, Mr. Garner himself. Here, this is the big book I talk about. This is called um, a Modern English uh, just a, a, a Guide on Usage. And this is published by Oxford um, only in the last 10 years before um, this title was officially given to Mr. Fowler, uh, Henry Fowler, uh, who was uh, um, just uh, perhaps the most well-known um, grammarians and usage expert from the UK. His work was published in early 20th century and dominated the field for 80 years. So the official title is uh, the Dictionary of Modern English Usage and also published by Oxford, meaning that this title belong to modern English usage belonged to Mr. Fowler for 80 years, then Mr. Gardner took it over. And uh, you know, English is English, right? Came from the UK and Oxford is the definitive authority on that. And you know how important those uh, works are. And you see a whole bunch of other, other English usage books. And uh, by the way, this Fowler's version is fourth edition. Don't buy it because it's very, very descriptive. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Here's another book by uh, Mr. Gunner, The Chicago Guide to Grammar Usage and Punctuation. So this is a kind of expanded version of the chapters in the Chicago Manual of Style. Uh, this is the 15th version, I believe. Currently, it's probably 18th edition now. I bought this particular version when I was in law school. Okay, it has been quite a few years. And here's another one, uh, Garner's Modern American Usage. This is actually the third edition of the one right beneath it, which is the fourth edition. So it's highly recommended that you buy the fourth edition of Garner's in Modern English Usage. And for grammar books, I don't have any one particular one that I want to recommend to you because most of the books here, are, I think two thirds are usage books. For grammar books, like I said, good ones tend to be very academic. They're not for high school or middle school students. And the one you can buy for high school and middle school students they're all bad. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, so let's get to the um, details. Grammar versus usage, we already talked about that. Here, there's one important takeaway you want to remember. When you write something, if you want to publish something, you will go through the editors, right? Whether it's book or some other form of work, even say at most newspapers, those editors or writers, they don't actually wrestle with grammar issues that much because grammar, as I said, is relatively simple. They wrestle with usage issues. Issues. A big part of usage is that how to choose words accurately. But those are things that we will not actually discuss too much in this uh, college ready uh, grammar class because our goal is still grammar you cannot learn how to just run until you learn how to walk right so we want to make sure that uh, we stay make sure we can help you to get a good understanding of the most important fundamental things on grammar first okay so here are a few quick examples that may interest you. Well, let's see the first quiz. What do these sentences mean? He didn't eat for long. He didn't eat for a long time. So what are the meanings of those sentences? And did you see other issues? Apparently those two sentences just differ by one little word. That's the article um, uh, or A 
for long time, for long. So that little word changed the whole meaning of the sentence. So the first one, he didn't eat for long, meaning that he had a very short session of eating. So he just quickly either finish his eating or just stop it for something else. So he didn't eat for long. The second one, he didn't eat for a long time. Actually, this sentence is problematic because for this particular phrase, for a long time, we typically want to use the perfect tense. So, uh, but there are situations for this to be legit, but most of the time, this sentence is not good. We should have written it as, he hasn't uh, eaten for a long time. That's typically how it should be written. But there are some cases where you can write a sentence like this. But regardless, the point is that for a long time, it's very different from for long in this context. This has nothing to do with how he actually eat for uh, just session, but it's just that he kind of didn't have food for a long time, all right? So you can see that a little thing can change the sentence usually um, in that sense. So what do this sentence mean? She likes to eat. She likes eating. First of all, does everybody know what to eat and eating if we want to put a part of speech to them, what do they stand for, at least in this context? Well, both stand for nouns. The first one to eat is uh, um, infinitive, and the second, eating, ing. There are two ing's in English, and it's one of the the most confusing part of the English language. And this particular one, we call it a gerund. A gerund is a noun. So in both cases, to eat, eating, kind of stand for nouns. So she likes either to eat or eating, she likes something. That's a noun, conceptually or logically. He likes to eat, means right now she's hungry. She wants to eat, but she likes to eat him means that she's a food lover. She likes eating in general. So this is a special case where the infinitive and the gerund have different meanings. But there are many verb, verbs that when you add an uh, infinitive or gerund, of the same verb to that, the, the main verb, the meanings are pretty much essentially the same. Sometimes there are slight difference, but not like this. In this case, the meaning totally they're different, okay? So, she enjoys to play piano. She enjoys playing piano. Similar structure, what is the meaning in either case here, or is there any problem? Uh, problems? <laughs> is there any problem? Okay. The problem here is that we actually do not use the first way at all. We actually, with this particular verb, enjoy, we do not say something like, she enjoys to play piano. We always say, she enjoys are playing piano, okay? Why? Well, that's a usage issue, okay? Some verbs just, they behave differently. She stopped to eat, she stopped eating. Do the two versions mean the same thing? Obviously not in this case. She stopped to eat means that there are two actions one after the other, she first stop, then to eat. Okay, so here, eat stands for another action that happens right after the first one, which is stop. And the second one, she stopped eating. 
This is just very similar to the uh, very first one she likes eating. Eating here is a uh, uh, German, but, uh, but in this case, she stopped eating. There is an eating action going on, so she stopped. She stopped that action. So again, we have uh, infinitive and general choice, but the result is very different from one of each other. Okay, so, oops. So let's consider a group of similar words. Advice, suggest, recommend, want. Uh, the last one is a little bit different from the first three, especially the first three, they sound like just very similar uh, synonym uh, to each other, but you have to understand how you use them. So in, for each of those verbs, I wrote two versions, right? So what are correct and the one not correct? Okay, you have to know that for advice, suggest, and recommend, those kind of verbs, when they introduce um, a clause, like a, I suggest that you go, this is called subjective mood. So the point is that here, of course, you go, have, it, it doesn't cause issue. But what if, say, I change you to she? I suggest that you goes? No. Even if we change you to she here in the red part, you still have to use a go. That does sound correct, right? Because she, you may want to use, uh, because in third party singular, you want to use it goes, but there's a very arcane rule called subjective mood here. So because this verb suggests, you want to use go for any uh, subject, whether it's third part singular or not. I suggest you to go. Will anybody write a sentence like this? Well, usually when you suggest, usually it's a single action. If you want to mean really this, you want to put that into a clause, not into an infinitive like this. Okay, um, that's actually the same for advice, suggest, recommend, all of them. You don't want to write something that I recommend you to go. Not just outright on English, okay? I advise you to go. No, you want to write a clause rather than uh, put you as an object name with an infinity. But look at the last one. I want you to go. I want that you go. Which one sounds correct? Of course, the first one. I want you to go. We just don't write something like, we want that you go. Okay? So all those things are kind of just a um, grammar usage. Sometimes the line between the two is blurry. It's kind of hard to get all those things correct. Um, that's why we need to study those things. Okay, so let's quickly talk about uh, part of parts of three. By the way, because of the technical glitch, we start late. So we probably, uh, it's 11.05 here in California, so we probably will run another five to 10 minutes, okay, before wrapping up today's session. So parts of speech, we already saw from that 100 year old book, uh, talking about English grammar in just two categories. One is parts of speech and one is sentence. So what are parts of speech? Yeah, it's just kind of very academic, fancy name. Perhaps some of you have already learned from school that it's just categories of words. Um, so in English, because those concepts came from Latin, which I don't know anything about. I just know those things 
actually came, the English grammar, the majority of it came from Latin, okay? So, but the concept is that every word in the sentence does some job. Of course, obviously, there's a job to do. Otherwise, you, why you put a word there? <coughs> but a word can have multiple parts of speech, at least in English. Uh, in dictionary, I'm sorry. In dictionary, it's very common. You see that on, on the one word entry, you see multiple entries. And that means that usually you see multiple parts of speech. <coughs> For example, a, ver uh, a word could be adverb, adjective, sometimes even verb and noun, all at the same time sometimes, sometimes with a preposition. But a word has more than two um, just kind of categories. It's quite common. But at any given sentence, a particular word only does one job. That's a golden rule, which logically is quite just easy to understand, right? If a word has two different jobs in the same sentence, then the reader can, has no way to correctly understand that at all. So a word always only have one part of speech in the given sentence. And every word in the sentence is doing one of those eight jobs, meaning that we actually have eight parts of speech in English. But we cannot actually know, or just by looking up a dictionary to tell a particular word what kind of part of speech it is in that sentence, unless we actually examine that particular sentence and how the word is positioned in that sentence. That's the only way to ascertain a word's parts of speech role in that particular sentence. That makes sense, right? Logically, you have to actually see it to make sure that that word is doing what kind of job. So here are the eight parts of speech. Now, pronoun, verb, adjective, adverb, conjunction, preposition, interjection. Sound familiar? Perhaps, but not all of them are equally understandable. Some are relatively easy, but some are very difficult. Well, it's very important to understand that every word in English belongs to those eight parts of speech, and the words are the building blocks of sentences and sentences are building block of your essays, your article, whatever. So studying grammar mostly stop at the sentence level. If you go even further at the paragraph level, that does not belong to grammar per se. That belongs to um, some usage issues, but mostly about writing style in general. That's a whole different level of things. So our study of grammar actually will stay relatively simple and easy. We will limit our study at the sentence level. So that's why uh, you saw that book, a hundred year old book, just discuss parts of speech and sentences. Okay, um, we will talk about each of the roles in details as we move along, but it's not too early to have a very important high-level understanding about those parts of speech. You see that this is the perfect division, right? Eight. Eight is a good number. Eight is two to the power of three. So it's an even, even, even. So you keep just dividing eight by two, you still get a, another integer unless you hit one, obviously. But here is a good division. In the first row, we have four parts of speech, noun, pronoun, verb, and adjective. Uh, noun and pronoun actually belongs to kind of same concept because a pronoun is generally uh, a nickname for a noun. When you 
use a pronoun, it points to another law, noun. So pronoun is just a pointer or nickname for a noun. So technically, it's not that kind of informative. What are the four categories or parts of speech that are most informative, carrying the most important information? Those are noun, verb, adjective, and adverb. Okay? But pronoun um, is hugely important. Uh, we have to have a very good handle on that, but luckily for us, not too many words. Overall, there are just a couple of dozen of pronouns in English, so there's no reason we cannot um, really understand well. So the, the important thing I want you to understand that noun, verb, adjective, and adverb, they carry most of the information uh, in English or in your sentences. On the other hand, pronoun, conjunction, preposition, and interjection, they they don't have that many numbers in the first place. And their functions are very different from noun, verb, adjective, and adverb, in the sense that they do not carry that much information. They are merely as connectors for the first three, and the interjection is a completely different animal. And relatively, the least important thing, or um, just worrisome thing um, for you, so pronoun, as I said, is a pointer. Um, that means that there are only two other little words, conjunction and the preposition. They are connectors. They, they are just glue, just connecting the more important words together. Of course, every, except interjection, every one of the other seven parts of speech hugely important. You need to um, understand all of them well. Your grammar knowledge cannot go to the next level unless you really keep a very logical mind. That's why I preach to other people, learn English writing just as math. You have to be very logical. So in terms of how to write English well, it boils down to how you write your sentence well, correctly and efficiently. And then you cannot do that without truly understand those eight parts of speech. I would say the first seven, the last one interjection is completely on an isolated island. So we don't have to worry about that too much. So for the other seven, unless you understand each one of them really well, you really cannot understand grammar. Okay, the sentence. Well, today is the first day, so we will start right, jump right into the water. water. So here, what is sentence? Your teacher your English teacher at school might have told you that, well, something like this. A sentence is a group of words expressing a complete thought, all that is good. And some add additionally with a subject and a verb. That's correct. Let's not debate on that. Of course, this is the correct definition of sentence. But it may not be the best in the sense that it's so abstract, it doesn't really give you much guidance at all. A group of words expressing a complete thought, what the heck does that mean? And subject and verb, unless you know what a subject is and what a verb is. So let's take a much more practical way at looking at this whole thing, all right? What is a sentence? Well, at the, if we strip down all the secondary or less important information in the sentence, a sentence really boils down to this structure. 
somebody or something, meaning either person or thing. Well, that thing could be kind of physical, concrete, real, or could be quite abstract, like a, an idea, a thought, an emotion, something like that. But it's something. That's the subject. Okay? Here's on the right hand side of this vertical bar is the verb part. That somebody or something, meaning the subject either does something or is something. Here, something means a noun, right? But sometimes the subject can is not just something or in some way. That means that something is a noun, and some way, some way is an adjective. So basically, a sentence logically looks like this: somebody or something does something or is something, and could be is in some way. This is the most just kind of practical way to interpret what a sentence is. Of course, as we said, we already stripped down all the unnecessary information. We just focus on the backbone or the just bare, bare minimal uh, structure of a sentence. A sentence can be much, much more complicated than this, but this really tells us log as a logical matter fundamentally what a sentence really is. Okay? Um, we will jump into four types of simple sentences right away. Okay? First, thing. Okay? Subject, first. That's a noun. Thing. That's a verb. So this is the simplest sentence you can find, unless you have some imperative sentence, which is technically a sentence, but it does not nominally have a subject. We'll talk about that. Let's just stop. That's a sentence. It only has one word because there's an understood subject that is missing. When I say stop, I really mean you, the listener of that or the reader of that sentence, stop. Usually it's listener. But that's a very special case. So other than that, every sentence, the bare, bare minimal, you need to have a subject and a verb. And this is the, the example, the simplest one you can have. And this is the action verb. Birds sing, okay? Okay, the next type of sentence is a little bit more complicated. Uh, she sang a sad song. Here, a sad, both words can be removed if we really want to see the, the bare minimal structure. So a sad is right here. Okay? So she sang songs. She is the subject. Sang is a transitive verb. It needs an object. So sang song. This is also the simplest sentence you can get. Sing and sam uh, both belong to the same word, right? The sing, but they behave differently. The first version is a, what we call an intransitive verb. It doesn't need any object after the verb. But the second one, this sing is a transitive verb. It needs an object, and that object is song. So rose are the simplest uh, action verb sentence you can find. Then comes the next. She is Beautiful. Okay. She is subject. The verb here is is. But this is is a be verb or what we also call a linking verb. If we saw the next word, this sentence does not make sense at all. If you just say she is, she's what? This sentence is ungrammatical because it does not finish an uh, idea because is is a linking verb, meaning that you have to tell something about the subject. There's no actual action. This is not an action verb. She is. So B 
because this linking verb it links the next word back to the subject. So you have to tell something about the subject, otherwise we cannot understand what you mean. And the idea is incomplete. So she's beautiful. This is an adjective. This adjective is describing the subject she. So therefore, this is the earlier. If you remember what we talk about, somebody or something is or uh, does something. So it's she is beautiful. But there's another one. She's a beautiful girl. In this case, what is that after the is? Well, just like she sang a sad song, a beautiful can be actually stripped down at this point. She is girl. So we again describe the subject. We tell she as subject is a girl. So girl is a noun here. Girl point back to she. They refer to the same person. So girl is just a, another name for she. We are talking about the same person here. So this is a different type of she is of structure. So rows full, very important structures actually essentially covered all the English sentences one of rows. Okay. Of course, we can uh, sometimes replace the verb, especially be verb can could be an other linking verb. But rows are the basic structure. Here I put rows. We are the structure like a graphic. Here we will talk about this next time. But I just want you to know we will study sentence diagramming right at the beginning. Okay, this is will be a hugely useful tool and hugely important tool, which unfortunately nowadays schools do not teach anymore. So we will see how row scenes fit into row structure. Bird scene. She said saw. Row's words are above the main line. So the less important words like a sad, a beautiful, they are below the main line. That's the point. She is beautiful. She is a beautiful girl. So we will talk about what rose means, and I have I again uh, I'm sorry for today's earlier technical glitch. We will stop here, and we will pick up right from where we are left off next week. Okay, I will see you next Sunday. Bye.